Good evening, and welcome to our featured event this evening. My name is Shirley Rush, and um, I'd like to welcome all of you to a very special talk as part of our UMPI's Distinguished Lecturer Series in conjunction with the Main Hunger Dialogue. We're very pleased to have Joel Berg, international hunger expert, author, and CEO of Hunger Free America as the first guest lecturer in our 2017-2018 Distinguished Lecturer Series. Our series has given us the opportunity to present a wide range of speakers, from astronauts and journalists to scholars and adventurers, for our campus and our community since 1999. In fact, according to our best count, this is our 108th DLS talk. Bringing distinguished lecturers to campus, all of whom have made significant contributions in their fields, is part of the university's mission. And we believe it's incredibly important to provide opportunities such as this collaboration with the Main Hunger Dialogue to gather and discuss the issues that impact us as a county and a state. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Frank Wertheim, the coordinator of our main Hunger Dialogue, and he is going to introduce our guest lecturer, Joel. Thank you for being here. Thank you, thank you, Shirley, and thank you, everyone. It's great to see members of the public joining our main Hubbard Dialogue participants. Um, <clears throat> I first learned about Joel, I think it was in 2010, short, uh, shortly after his, his first book uh, came out, uh, All You Can Eat, How Hungry Is America, uh, which is a, a really good uh, book because of a wonderful perspective on, um, on the situation of food insecurity in the United States. Uh, and it, even though it's from 2009, I still highly recommend it. And last year when I was at the University Fighting World Hunger Summit, um, Joel was one of the keynote speakers. And when I saw him and I had previously read his book and saw what an engaging speaker he was, uh, I wanted to invite him here tonight. And I'm so, so happy that he was willing uh, to come all the way to Prescott Isle from New York City via a puppy flight from Boston, <laughs> from what I understand. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I will quickly introduce him. So forgive me for, for, for reading a bio. Uh, There's a lot of good information here. Um, why the U.S. has hunger and how we can end it. Really. Labeled Mr. Franny Pants by The Daily Show with Jon Stewart, in which he once appeared. Joel is an author and CEO of Hunger Free America, which, um, <clears throat> which the nation called one of the leading direct service and advocacy organizations for hunger and poverty in the nation. Joel recently published his second book, America, We Need to Talk, a self-help book for the nation. You can, you can tell from the top titles and uh, Joel, when you hear him speak, there's a little bit of humor involved in this, but it is a serious topic. And he has both books with him tonight, which afterwards will be available um, for purchase and for author signing. Um, Nobel laureate Tony Morrison called the book an import, important and entertaining. Also, Joel wrote the decades definitive book on hunger, All You Can Eat, How Hungry Is America. Uh, Playboy.com, which Joel reads only for the reviews, uh, <laughs> called the book refreshing for its optimism, rash, rationality, and passion. He's also published numerous op-eds, poems, and policy papers. has been a senior fellow of both the Center for American Progress and Progressive Policy Institute, two DC-based think tanks, and he previously worked for the USDA as a senior executive service appointee of President Bill Clinton. I'd like to welcome Joe Berg. That guy sounds great, can't wait to meet him. So I was in the neighborhood, I thought I'd drop in. 
it was either a here or Fort Kent or Caribou tonight, so I decided to come to uh, Presque Isle. Thank you for the in invitation. So, uh, how many long-term Mainers does it take to screw in a light bulb? That's a rather personal question, don't you think? <laughs> That's my one main joke. <laughs> Other than your governor, sorry. Oh, oh. It's great to be in the county. It takes some New York style let's but to label yourself the county. Just like we in New York City, we're the city. So it's great to be here. I normally just talk about uh, domestic uh, issues, and that's what we're going to focus on tonight. I did want to follow up on, on the earlier discussion and, and, and just say, I, I think there's a misunderstanding that you know farmers want to use a hoe, the same technology as a thousand years ago, because it would preserve their you know culture. And let me tell you, there are plenty of countries in the world that preserve their culture and use modern technology, and the vast majority of people in those countries are thrilled to preserve their culture and have running water and have electricity and have all the modern tools of productivity. And every nation on the planet that significantly reduced hunger has done so using modern technology. I'm not saying you throw a tractor into a village tomorrow without roads, without gas, without repair, but over the long run, there's a way to balance modernity with uh, with uh, you know, human progress, and, and the vast majority of people in the world prefer having less malaria, not more malaria, but the vast majority prefer having penicillin, not no penicillin, and the vast majority would prefer using you know, modernity instead of staying in the hot sun from uh, dawn to, to dusk and dying very young. So that's the one thing I'd say uh, about that. Uh, I'm, I'm mostly going to talk about hunger by, uh, and the themes in my first book, but I'm going to talk a little about and I'll talk for about 45 minutes, then open up for questions, debate, or non-debate if you're taciturn Mainers. Uh, but uh, a few words about my new book. It is about US politics. And you say, well, we're hunger fighters. Why are you talking about politics? And for a hunger fighter not to want to talk about politics is like a doctor not wanting to talk about medicine. The reason we have these problems is because of our broken political system. And the way we need to solve these problems is by fixing our political system. So my new book is a parody of self-help books. So it has chapters like why buy the politician when you can get the milk for free. Uh, uh, the first chapter is the breakup chapter. America, I love you, but I'm not in love with you anymore. Another is uh, they're just not into you. Why white guys are voting against the Democrats. Another is Republicans are from Mars, Democrats are from Venus, so on and so on. And each chapter is based on a different famous self-help book and cliche. But the serious message, the serious message of it is that there is a relationship that needs to be fixed. It's a relationship between the American people and our country and our government. And just as in most relationships, it's a cop-out to just blame one side, it's an entire cop-out for anyone in this country to say it's the politician's fault or it's the system's fault. Well, who created the system? Who elected the politician? We did, either by voting or worse, non-voting. So you can just say, oh, the other side stinks, or have this ridiculous claim that both sides are the same. Well, no two human beings are the same, no two systems are the same, and the political parties certainly aren't the same. So it's just a cop-out to say, they're all lousy, none of this matters. We will see through my talk that public policy does matter, and people's movement changed things for the better. But to get all that, you'll have to buy my new book, and I'll be glad to sign it. <laughs> And uh, the copy's going today, I'll go to Penny of them, the money's going to Hunger Free America, so just so you uh, know. A few words about Maine specifically, and you may have covered this in, in, in the rest of the talks here, but uh, as you probably know, the food insecurity rate in Maine is now 16.4%. It's the seventh worst rate of hunger in the entire country, by far the highest rate in the whole north of the United States. And it wasn't always this way. Maine used to have a hunger rate about similar to the rest of the country. But over the last decade, it's increased by 27%. 27%. Now, what happened here over the last decade? Hmm. Just a fact. Also just a fact that certain politicians campaign as moderates and get a lot of attention for their so-called moderation, because once in a blue moon they vote against a bill that's Horrible, 
truly ghastly, such as uh, taking away health care from tens of millions of people, and so then when they vote for something only 90% as ghastly, they get a lot of credit for supposedly being moderate. And I'll be very specific. Just in this last week, the United States Senate passed a budget bill which will increase our deficit by $1.5 trillion. That's trillion with a T. The entire U.S. budget deficit's about half a million, uh, about half a trillion uh, dollars. And so the tax cuts alone are three times the entire U.S. budget deficit for a year. And there's no question if this bill is then enacted into subsequent legislation, it will significantly increase hunger in America because then they'll turn around and say, oh, we don't have any money left. Look at the deficit. We don't have money for SNAP. We don't have money for school lunch. We don't have money for school breakfast. We don't have money for summer meals. We can't support a jobs program. Uh, so understand, those are the stakes. And I'm not being partisan, I'm just being factual. Senator King voted against it. Senator Collins voted for it. So look back, you know, six months from now, and then they'll say, oh, we have, we have no control. The budget resolution is making us just, they voted for the re budget resolution. I usually don't do slides because they're distracting, but some people say, speak too quickly. Uh, and they can't understand everything I say, so put it in slides. Now, I, I tell you, I usually speak quickly, but I've been doing a lot of speaking in the South and the Midwest, and so I've slowed down. So understand, this is me slow. Anyway, anyway, we can dim the lights a little. Can you see these back there? Okay, well, I'll go through the charts quickly. And again, you can buy the book to, to get it in full. But th this shows America compared to the rest of the world on food insecurity. And we have a higher rate of hungry food insecurity than the Slovak Republic and Greece. And it's not because we have less food. And understand over and over again, the reason there's hunger in the world is not lack of food, it's lack of political power of low-income people, and they don't have enough money to buy the food, or don't have the land or the other resources to produce it. And here, we have enough food to feed the world many times over, it's that low-income people just don't have the money to buy food. Okay, second chart. See Mr. Monopoly there representing billionaire wealth in America, and that's not all billionaires, that's just the Forbes 400 list. You know, when I was growing up, I'm dating myself now, I knew two billionaires in America. There was like J. Paul Getty and Howard Hughes. Now, there's so many billionaires in America, merely having a billion dollars doesn't get you on the Forbes 400 list. If you only have like $1.3 billion, you're not rich enough to be one of the 400 wealthiest Americans. You need something like $1.4 billion. So just, just those 400 people, the blue line with Mr. Monopoly, don't sue me, Parker Brothers, or do, it'll be good publicity, uh, has skyrocketed through the roof. The red line, represented by Fantine from Les Mis, if that looks familiar, <coughs> is food insecurity or hunger in uh, America. You will see uh, two things. That number one is the greatest single variable affecting hunger in America and in Maine is the economy. The existence and availability of food support programs like SNAP, food stamps, and school lunch and school meals are important, but the single greatest variable by far is the economy. So you see that huge leap up in 2008 when the economy had collapsed. And I was on the road talking, giving a talk somewhat like this in Illinois that day. And Someone called me from my office with the numbers, and I thought they were reading the charts wrong. It's, it's, it, it, you're not telling me it went from 36 million to 50 million in one year. That's statistically impossible. And it did. And then you saw that despite the economic recovery for years and years and years and years, it was still at that recession high. Only in the last two years, 2015 and 2016, was there a drop as the economy finally started to impact not just Wall Street, the improvements, but rank and file people started in most places, or in many places, getting wage increases and a real drop in unemployment. So there's some good news. And things aren't always getting worse and worse. They do go up and down. The other thing to note, though, is the number now is 41 million. 41 million Americans live in households that can't afford enough food. That's more than the combined population of Maine and California. So people sometimes try to minimize this, oh, it's the small little problem where it's non-white people. You know, the largest number of people in America who are poor, I hope you guys understand this, are white. 
The largest number of people who receive SNAP food stamps in America are white. The largest number of people get cash welfare, although virtually no one gets cash welfare are white. And it's particularly amusing to me, amusing and not a good way in this state, sort of the racial bashing when the population of non-whites is so small, but the claim by others that the implication that's a non-white problem is preposterous anywhere in the United States, but particularly preposterous here. Or the claim that people are moving to Maine because of the high welfare benefits here. You do understand they're lower than anywhere in the region. Maybe they're moving here for the February weather. <laughs> so, the thing to notice is that it went down a little, but that it was 36 million before the recession, and now it's 41 million. So even though the stock market's at its highest level in recorded history, there are still 5 million more people hungry than before the start of the recession, and we're told to accept this as the new normal. So I can chart now. There, there may be some foodies here telling me, well, if, if low-income people just shop better and were less ignorant about what's healthy for them and just cook more and grew all their own food from scratch, as if you had a 12-month growing season here, um, you know, that they wouldn't be hungry and that the real cause of hunger is personal irresponsibility. Well, first of all, 90% of the people who receive SNAP benefits were working the year before and the year after getting SNAP if they have children. 90% of the people receiving SNAP benefits were working the year before and the year after getting SNAP. And the majority of people getting SNAP today are working parents, children, senior citizens, veterans, and people with disabilities. It's just crap they're not working adults. That's number one. Number two, the main cause is economics. Look at the national minimum wage versus look at hunger. The bottom line is if the rent you're paying is almost as much as the money you're earning in your two or three jobs, you don't have enough money left over. It's not about laziness, it's about something fundamentally broken in the US economy. Here's an example, a fine gentleman I, I know, he has a master's degree from his uh, home country, but he's uh, living here. He's a great community activist, he's president of his PTA, and he until recently, uh, working full time, was making uh, $450 per week and had to get uh, help from food pantries to feed his, his family. This is probably my most important chart. So this is the number of people U.S. households who live below the poverty line, and you know, the poverty line is ridiculous. Now it's roughly like $19,000 for a family of three. And it's the same in rural Maine or rural West Virginia as in New York City. It's not regionally adjusted at all, which is insane, because the housing costs are so dramatically different. But, I'm not a math whiz, it won't shock you to know, I did better in the debate team than, uh, you know, in, in the math league. But, so, 2009 to 2012, four years, 48 months, right? Over those 48 months, no shock, even in a deep recession, most Americans weren't living in poverty. But get this, what percentage of Americans dip below the poverty line for two or more months? 34%. Nearly a third of everyone in America lived below the poverty line, the very meager poverty line, for at least two months. What percentage of Americans were below the poverty line all 48 months? 2.75%, less than 3%. What does that mean in slightly less wonkish terms? Although this is a university, I can talk wonkishly, but in slightly less wonkish terms, this means that the number of Americans who are sometimes poor is 10 times the number of Americans who are always poor. Let me repeat that. The number of Americans who are sometimes poor is 10 times the number of Americans who are always poor. Now, I don't mean to discount the number of Americans who are always poor, or, or nearly always poor, because that's a significant problem, and 2.75% out of a country of over 300 million people is still over 10 million people in nearly perpetual poverty, but that's not the main problem. Why is this important? Because the narrative in America, the media narrative, the conservative narrative, and if I may be blunt, as you figured out I may, that the vast majority of even upper middle class white liberals think that the majority of poverty in America is long term. And if you think it's long term, you also have the racial subtext of the racist belief that it's all non-white people. 
And therefore, you have the belief that it's cultural, that there's something wrong with them. They're drug abusers. They don't want to work. And that's the narrative of hunger in America. And poverty in America, they're not just working hard enough. And so if you really believe that all poverty in America was their parents were poor, their grandparents were poor, they've always been poor their whole life, they've never worked, that's one narrative. But if you understand that the vast majority of people in America are sometimes poor, sometimes not poor, that many people, even in that 2.75%, have been working at some points and still living below the pile. You understand the main problem isn't laziness. The main problem isn't drug abuse. The main problem is the structural, fundamental unfairness of the US economy. The fact that we're one of the only industrialized Western nations of the world where full-time working people don't earn enough to feed their families. If you're working in a McDonald's in Copenhagen, you're working, you're earning more than $20 an hour, or roughly that starting wage. And for all the talk like, oh, you know, uh, businesses can't stay in, intact for that, and you know, the minimum wage increases will hurt working people. It's just not true. If you've been to Copenhagen, they're doing fine. And just uh, one other side from this. You guys believe in science, right? I hope. Yeah. Some? Yeah. I know some people say evolution is just a theory. But they, gravity is a theory, right? And to, did, did anyone want to bet me that if I drop this pen, it's going to hit the riser? Anyone want to bet me? It worked. Okay. If I take water, pure distilled water, and bring it down to sea level, and make it 200 degrees Fahrenheit. Anyone want to bet me that's not going to turn to steam? Anyone going to bet me that if I take it down to 100 degrees below zero, it's going to turn to ice? Any exceptions? No. So why don't we understand social science has a set of immutable rules? That when you give tax cuts to the ultra rich, explode the deficit, and then use that as an excuse to cut social programs, hunger and poverty goes up. And when you do the reverse, hunger and poverty go down. It's not just an opinion. It's not just an ideology. It's a proven fact based on decades of data. And when you look at this, you understand that the debate we're having now in the country, the policy debate and the political debate, well, do we help inner city struggling people or do we help you know, rural struggling people? And the racial assumption of that is a dumb debate. It's done politically. It's done Policy-wise, the very things that are increasing poverty in America are the very same things destroying the middle, American middle class. They're not two sets of issues. They're one set of issues. Lack of jobs, lack of connections between skills and where jobs exist, low wages, the fact that we're the only industrialized Western country in the world that doesn't have guaranteed free health care, the fact that we're one of the few industrialized Western countries in the world where you don't have free education. And if you think I'm a horrible socialist, I'll remind you you're in a socialist institution right now, a government-run institution. So any libertarians here who are going to this institution and who drove over a public road to get here and walked over a public sidewalk after playing in a public park and want to condemn me for saying we should have public things like public food programs will have that debate. But understanding that this is the central problem in America today. Another way of looking at it, the red line is minimum wage. The green monopoly house is how much money an average family needs to have even a two-bedroom house in America, when housing prices go through the roof, people don't have money left over for food. Another way of looking at it, the orange line is how productive American workers have been. The green line is uh, how much they're getting paid. They're not getting low compensation because they're not working their kishkas off. That's a New York term we'll explain later. <laughs> Look up in the joys of your dish and you can tell me shellfish terms or whatever you do. Uh, but, I have no FU. I went to, and this is my second time in Prescott. When I worked for USDA in the, the 90s, I did come here and visit some projects that the, uh, uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service at USDA ran. And I actually met someone whose title was Shellfish Warden. And I thought, if there's a more stereotypical main occupation than Shellfish <laughs> Warden, I don't know what there is, but I met one. Anyway, back to this. I'm usually not this rambling. OK, except for always. Uh, so productivity per hour versus hourly compensation. Look at this. The blue line is how much income out of America the middle class has, and the red line is uh, how many people are in labor unions in America. Just a coincidence, right? Now, you may not be aware of this, but Frederick Douglass is dead. Huh? <laughs> that, that, that didn't get up here when Frederick 
President Trump implied that Frederick Douglass has been dead for over 100 years or still alive. Anyway, my point of this is Frederick Douglass once said, power never conceives itself willingly, it never has, and never will. And if you think the decline of wages has nothing to do with the decline of the American labor movement, I'd ask you to explain that chart. Now, as much as I said the largest number of people in America who are poor are white, it's also important to note that people of color and women are disproportionately low income, are disproportionately facing hunger, and in fact, non-white people are basically twice as likely as white people to be in households facing hunger. But as vast as the difference on income is, the difference on assets, what people own, dwarfs that. So the top is Latino families below that, black families below that, white families, what people own, medium wealth. A lot of that's in housing value, People of color are far less likely to own homes, and when they do, they are worth a lot less, and the mortgage crisis disproportionately hurt communities of, of color. And all the other things we want to do about racial justice, I hope most of us want to do to make this a more racially just country, we cannot achieve unless we do something about the basic economics underlying many of these social problems. Who is making the money in America? CEOs, not workers. Got that? Next. <laughs> So some, there'll be some economic student here who oh, Joel, this is just an immutable law of economics. You can't fight it. And you know, just as there are people who are paid by oil companies to tell you that climate change isn't happening, what, what was the temperature today here versus what was 40 years ago? And I know you can't judge climate change based on one day. But uh, you know, uh, yeah, it was like uh, in the hundreds in the Pacific Northwest. Something's going on. And people are paid by oil companies to lie to you, saying climate change isn't happening. And there are people paid by businesses that depend on low wages to lie to you. So the real reason they're against wage increases is not that they're greedy. It's they're, they're worried about their workers. <laughs> they're really worried that if they had to pay more wages, they'd, they'd have to pay off workers. It's not true. We know it's not true. There have been economic models for the last hundred years that show it's not true. But now that the minimum wage nationally has been so low so long, states have taken it on their own to raise the minimum wage. But yet many states, more conservative states, still have the same minimum wage. A bunch of states in the South have minimum wages below the national minimum wage or have no minimum wage at all. And by the way, some of the states in the Union that have the highest percentage of their population non-white also are the states with the lowest minimum wage. I don't think that's a coincidence either. In any case, California and New York and places like Seattle have minimum wages far higher than the national average, and they tend to have unemployment rates lower than the national average. So this claim that if you raise wages, you're going to get rid of jobs just isn't true. So the other thing is, like, well, inequality, that's just a natural part of the you know, economic theory. There's nothing we can do about it. And this shows you, I don't know if you can see back there, the blue line atop is inequality in the United States, basically the top of wealth owned by the top 1%, and the rest are some of our competitor nations. And for all this you know, deal that every place else is, is miserable, it's not true. Now, we're not too far from the Canadian border, right? How far are we here from Canada? 10 miles. How much? 10 miles. 10 miles. Now, I, I, I came here from the airport. I did not see large caravans of Canadian refugees escaping the oppression of having health care. <laughs> did, did, did you? And I'm here, you know, uh, I shouldn't fall. The, no, I, won't, I won't make my joke. Uh, okay. uh, but you don't see. For all the, the mythology that, oh, healthcare is horrible in Canada, yes, there's some really wealthy people who want to jump the line in Canada and get some top-notch procedure and they'll pay to come here, but the vast majority of Canadians, including the most conservative people, there's no way they trade our system for theirs when it comes to healthcare. And you see countries like Canada doing better economically, at the same time they have far less inequality. This isn't about laws of economics, this is how we structure our society. I've depressed you, so here's a cute little pig eating ice cream. Cheer up. <laughs> Remember Dick Cheney? <laughs> Dick Cheney once said the reason, I'm paraphrasing, but pretty close, he said the reason we had no money for the military is we spent all that money on food stamps and highways. <laughs> he said that, I'm not making this up. So this chart, the guns represent military spending. The little yellow represents food stamps or SNAP, and the red represents highways. Dick Cheney lied. 
<laughs> okay, now more talk about the importance of tax cuts. The left-hand column is the cost of tax breaks in America overwhelmingly go to the rich. And then you see the other top expenditures, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, defense spending, with everything else that's non-defense, that's discretionary, that's supposed to be a national park there, that's supposed to be a bear. Enjoy. And then SNAP food stamps is on the right. Now you've heard people in Congress say, particularly conservatives, we should treat the national budget like a household budget, right? Have you ever heard them say that? We should treat the national budget like a household budget. Now let me ask you this. When you're doing your household budget, a dollar you earn has the exact same 100 pennies of worth as a dollar you spend, right? Let me repeat that. A dollar you earn has the exact same 100 pennies as a dollar you spend, right? But when it comes to Congress, the people are pushing tax cuts for the wealthy, they never say that tax cuts cost anything. They have this myth that's been proven over and over and over again that it's going to magically reduce the deficit because there would be all this economic growth. It's not true, and we've got to understand that this is real spending, including a real deficit. Now, you want some good news? Yes. Uh, ever heard of Frances Perkins? She may even have some main connection. She's originally from Maine, and she went to school in Massachusetts. Anyway, she's the first female cabinet secretary in U.S. history. And in fact, the first female cabinet secretary in New York State history, she was uh, then Governor Al Smith's Secretary of Labor, and then Franklin Roosevelt's Secretary of Labor as governor. And then when he became president, she became his Secretary of Labor. And very significant in American history, she wrote some of the first worker safety legislation, she wrote some of the first minimum wage legislation. Uh, she helped create the Social Security Act. The Department of Labor building in D.C. is named after her, and she's one of the few people with a building named after her in Washington that actually deserves it. <laughs> the building I worked in in Washington, D.C., the Jamie Whitten Administration Building of USDA, is named after Arden, uh, an Arden segregationist, and I don't think a sewer should be named after him, no less the USDA building, but there you have it. <laughs> anyway. Frances Perkins wrote her master's thesis as a young uh, master's student at Columbia, my alma mater in New York, in 1908 on hunger in New York City in 1908. And in 1908, the kids were starving to death the way you might see in the developed world today. Distended bellies, rickets, they were eating maybe one or two light soups a day with mostly, mostly water, and they really had malnutrition the way you'd see in the developing world today. My good news is, the hungriest kids in America today are far better off than they were in 1908. The hungriest kids in America today are far better off than they were in 1908. Now, I'm not excusing the horrible levels of food insecurity we have here. It's far worse than any other industrialized country. The food insecurity we have here makes people die earlier. Kids can't perform well in school. To be schooled, you must be fueled. To be well read, you must be well fed. Those are my two Dr. Seuss lines. You know, workers can't be competitive unless they're well fed. A Nobel Prize winning economist found that one of the top reasons England excelled in the Industrial Revolution wasn't technology, but it was the improved nutritional status of workers. And we know hungry uh, seniors are far less likely to be independent. Not only a, a great moral shame when they're no longer able to stay at their home, and a great heartbreak for everyone involved, but a huge cost to the American economy. So hunger in our country costs us $167 billion a year. In higher educational loss, costs more health care costs, less perf uh, worker performance. So I'm not excusing the level of hunger we have here by any ways or stretch of the imagination, but it's still better than it was in 1908. Why? In 1908, there was no SNAP program. There was no national school lunch program. There was no national school breakfast program. There was no women's infants and children nutrition program. There was no summer meals program. Food banks didn't exist. Food pantries didn't exist. There are a handful of soup kitchens, but those were mostly missions on the skid rows of America, serving a handful of indigent men. There were no minimum wage legislation whatsoever. And because over the decades we addressed those issues, we dramatically reduced hunger. The first model food stamps program was created in 1939. I just wrote to the Roosevelt Library asking for them to do something to commemorate it two years when it's 
the anniversary, the, I thought for years and years and years, everyone said, including USDA, the first recipient of uh, food stamps benefits in 1939, and it was a discount coupon program in 1939. You had to get some money down and get little discount coupons. It was started in Rochester, New York, and everyone said the first food stamp recipient was a woman named Mabel McFiggin. And I love repeating that name over and over again. It's such a great name. Just say it with me, Mabel McFiggin. And a friend of mine did some further research on this and found the original article. She wasn't the first food stamps recipient. The first food stamps recipient refused to talk to the reporter. She was the first one that talked to the reporter. So stigma in this program goes back to the very first recipient in 1939. But anyway, the program helped. Then the Civilian Conservation Corps helped, a program based on work. Civilian Conservation Corps people got three meals a day, which was a huge, huge, huge deal at the time. The average man in the CCC gained 18 pounds. And if you've seen pictures of them, it wasn't because they were fat. They were pure muscle because they're doing work today that would be done by machines. Because it was a big deal, they got that help. And some of the other New Deal programs, you know, particularly Social Security, we do senior hunger and, and senior poverty. But by the late, by the mid-40s, there was still serious malnutrition in America, and generals came to President Truman and said, our boys are too hungry to fight. Our boys are too hungry to fight. And so the generals got together with President Truman and some very conservative people in Congress to create the National School Lunch Program as a defense mechanism. And then in the 1960s, we had the war on poverty. And many people are told that the war on poverty failed. Even many progressives I know, many liberals I know, believe basically the right-wing line that the war on poverty was a failure. I state the war on poverty started with the election of President Kennedy. His first executive order of president was creating uh, the modern food stamp program, resurrecting it. It went away in World War II. Uh, and then continued really through Richard Nixon. On, on social programs, he, he'd be considered a liberal Democrat uh, today. And he left office in 1974, not voluntarily. Until that time, the most crooked, crazy president in American history. Anyway, I'm just saying until that time, I didn't mention anyone else. Anyway, so between 1960 and 1974, that was the length of the war on poverty. The poverty rate in America was cut in half. The poverty rate in America was cut in half. 16 million Americans left poverty and entered the middle class. If, and I can say this, I, people in my family die of pancreatic cancer, and it's a genetic disease, so I'm using this as an example pointedly. If you're the head of the American Pancreatic Cancer Association, just bring a hose, thank you. <laughs> Two-fisted drinker. I should be a banger, sorry. Ooh. I won't be happy until I'm actually thrown out of a complete state. I'm working. <laughs> anyway. Between 1960 and 1974, the poverty rate in America is cut in half. If you were head of the American Pancreatic Cancer Association, and over a 14-year period you cut pancreatic cancer in half, you'd say that is a huge, huge, huge accomplishment. You wouldn't say, oh, there's still some pancreatic cancer, it was a failure. But that's what the right says about the poverty program. Oh, there's still poverty, it was a failure. Well, imagine them applying that to the military. Well, there's still some enemies. Obviously, every penny we spent on the military since the revolution was a waste. It doesn't make any sense at all. When we applied anti-poverty solutions, poverty went down. When we took them away, poverty went up. It's that simple. You wouldn't say if you're in a developing country and there's a lot of communicable disease, you bring in penicillin and the diseases go down, you take the penicillin away, the diseases go up, the penicillin didn't work. That's the same logic they apply to poverty programs. Well, poverty's gone up. Well, they took away the solution. So those programs helped. We cut poverty <laughs> in half, but by the late 1960s, we still had pockets of third world style malnutrition in America. We know because teams of doctors traveled around to places like white areas of Appalachia, like Latino areas of the Mexican American border, like uh, African American areas of the Deep South or some inner cities. And we found that there were still pockets of third world style malnutrition. Dr. King's Poor People's Movement mobilized around that, generated media coverage, and forced Richard Nixon from denying hunger was a problem to holding the first and only White House summit on hunger. And building a bipartisan coalition, when there are still bipartisan people in Congress who did this work, to create the truly modern food stamp program, which wasn't a discount coupon program anymore that any low-income person without a penny could get. 
creating the Women's Infants and Children Program, created by Richard Nixon, by executive order, the forerunner of the Women's and Infants and Children Program, matching the school lunch program with the school breakfast program, creating the summer meals program. All these programs combined with a robust economy that had middle class job growth and unionized living wage jobs, not only reduced poverty in America, but by the late 1970s, we almost entirely ended hunger in America. Let me repeat that. By the late 1970s, we almost entirely ended hunger in America. So why in the world are you guys living in a state where one out of six people are struggling against hunger? Why in the world are we living in a country where 41 million of our neighbors, including 13 million American children, are struggling against hunger? It's because of this. The bucket brigades. I was going to get around to this slide. I thought I forgot it. <laughs> it's all a plan. We used to fight fires in big cities with bucket brigades. They made us feel great. They were the faith-based armies of compassion of their time. You didn't need a big government program. You didn't need a lot of bureaucracy. Someone just yell out, fire! There's a picture of one. There's only one teensy weensy little problem with the bucket brigades. They didn't work. <laughs> they didn't work. City after city burned to a crisp. New York City, 1776. We don't know whether George Washington's troops purposely burned down New York so you wouldn't get the prize that was New York. We don't know whether Mrs. O'Leary's cow really locked over a can lantern starting the Great Chicago Fire, but we do know Chicago was ashes in days. There you go. There's Chicago right after the fire. There were big earthquakes in San Francisco and Seattle. That's not what leveled the cities. It was the fires that followed. Why? Well, one morning at 3 a.m. when I was writing my first book, I bolted out of bed to calculate how much water a bucket brigade could deliver in an hour. I'm sure many of you have done the same thing. <laughs> and 60 gallons of water a minute. And then I found sometimes people were sick from cholera and yellow fever. There weren't enough men. You know, it was mostly men who, who, who did this. The water would evaporate. It would freeze. And not everyone showed up at 3 a.m. in February. And they didn't have modern technology. They couldn't get to the second or third floor. And then I used my really sophisticated research device to figure out how much water could a modern fire truck deliver in a minute. I used Google. A thousand gallons of water a minute. And I told this to a, a, fire, leader, a fire union leader recently. He said, oh, now it's up to 2,000 gallons of water a minute. Okay. So let me ask you. You didn't know you were going to get a quiz, but here's the quiz. You're in your house. You're with all your prized possessions, your family photo, your, your cats, you're on the third floor, all your prized possessions. The, uh, the program for this main hunger dialogue, the two copies of my book you went out and bought, all your prized possessions. You're, you're there on your third floor. Which would you prefer? A volunteer bucket brigade, which may or may not show up, but if they do show up, they'll have 60 gallons of water a minute. And they can't reach the third floor where you're on. Or would you prefer a professional fire department who's paid by your tax dollars that will be there guaranteed in seconds because your tax dollars are paid for them to be there. And I know rural areas sometimes have volunteer fire departments that create, but they don't work in you know, big urban areas. Professional fire department. I don't know what New York City firefighters are doing when they're not fighting fires. They're like posing for calendars or they're cooking their grandmother's lasagna recipe. But everyone in my city is darn glad they're willing to risk their lives when we're running away. Anyway, which would you prefer, the bucket brigades or professional fire department? With a thousand gallons of water a minute versus a sixty gallons of water a minute. Anyone here? This, this is a conservative state. Right? You, you split your electoral college. There are people independent of, of government here. There's certainly some libertarians here, some flinty, self-sufficient New Englanders. So anyone here want to tell me that you would prefer the volunteers to save you and your family and your house? Anyone? I gotta tell you, I've done this in states more conservative than Maine, Alabama to Alaska to Arizona. Some really conservative places where they love the Tea Party, they love conservatives. Not once. Not once. And I won't tell you I'm recycling my speeches, but uh, not once has a single audience member, not a single audience member, probably thousands, maybe tens of thousands, okay, thousands. I have the biggest audiences ever. Ever. Not once do one of these, okay, dozen people 
<laughs> say to me they prefer the volunteers. So here's the punchline. If volunteers aren't good enough to save your family, why don't we say they're good enough to save the 41 million Americans suffering from hunger? Can't we see that canned food drives are nothing more than the bucket brigades of today? They make us feel good, but they're not solving the problem. Instead of one bucket at a time, one bucket at a time, and the city burns down, it's one can at a time, one can at a time, and the country is hungrier than ever. And all the great stuff you're doing with community kitchens, keep it up. All the great work you're doing with volunteerism, keep it up. But if you have five hours in a day, you should use your most efforts on the advocacy needed to change the public policy because that's the only thing that almost ended hunger in America, the only thing that's ended hunger in the other countries of the world that don't, end hung that don't have hunger today, and the only thing that will end hunger in America today. Think about a canned food drive. If your grandmother couldn't afford enough prescription drugs, would you say, A, there should be a government program to help your grandmother afford the prescription drugs she and her doctor think they need, or would you say, B, let's hold a prescription drug drive and tell everyone to go into their medicine cabinet and donate the food they think grandma needs? I always get uncomfortable laughs with that. That's intended. That's what a food drive is. You have no idea what these people that are getting help from you, these people, I even use that horrible phrase, people getting help from you need. You have no idea whether they have high diabetes or hypertension. God forbid you know their cultural preferences, whether they're kosher or halal or vegetarian. Goodness forbid you even know or care what they want to eat. You're donating the 10 year old pie mix from your cabinet. Not you guys, but other people. <laughs> and saying that's the answer. Food drives, even if you look at the broader charitable food sector, because food drives are just a small percentage of what food banks and soup kitchens and food pantries and food rescue groups and community kitchens give out, every charity in America provides less than one twentieth of the value of food provided by the federal safety net. The federal safety net is way underutilized. Many hungry people are not eligible for SNAP. Many hungry people who are eligible for SNAP are treated like dirt in places like Maine, Franklin, so they don't get the benefit. Even though a third of the people in the country eligible for SNAP don't get it, even though half the kids who get school lunch on a daily basis don't get school breakfast, even though there are millions of eligible infants who don't get WIC, even though 80% of the kids who get school lunch don't get summer meals, even with that underutilization of the federal nutrition safety net, it's still 20 times the dollar amount of every morsel of food given out by every charity in America. You can charity and charity and charity from now to kingdom come. We're only going to dent this problem. The only logical way to solve this problem is to get our society to do its job to get our economy to do its job, and to get our elected officials to do their job, not pretending to be moderates, and then give $1.5 trillion in tax cuts to the mega rich and say that's going to force them to cut school meals programs. And that's the reality of the world. I promised you I'd end with something happy. Okay, I'm done. I'll just close with this. We know people's movements work. We know people's movements work. Whether you're pro-marriage equity or against marriage equity, personally my organization doesn't take a position on pro-marriage equity, but whether you're against or for it, you must admit there's massive change in American society. And if I was here 40 years ago and said, you know what, in 2017, gay people are going to be able to get married, and not just in New York and Massachusetts and California, but all 50 states, you'd say I'm crazy. But they did what every successful social movement in American history has done. They mobilized the people most affected, and we as a hunger movement got to do a lot more to mobilize actual hungry people, not just say that upper middle class white people are going to fix that for them. Mobilize the people most affected, convince the people in the middle, not just the people who agree with us, not just the people at some you know, Portland uh, coffee shops, uh, but you know, places like this, and really convince the whole state, the whole country, all of middle America, and middle Maine, and down east and everywhere, and tell the truth about the opposition in a polite, respectful, fact-based way that they're lying. And that's what we have to do. Mobilize the people most affected, convince people in the middle, and ostracize in a polite, democratic, respectful way the other side when they make up stuff like saying people are hungry because they're not working. And we can build the social movement necessary to do this. It's really easy. I said hunger costs our society $167 billion a year. I've calculated it. We can end it for about $25 billion a year in extra food purchasing power for low-income people. And notice I say food purchasing power. I don't think it should all be SNAP. I think the top spending should be on wage subsidies or job creation. So $25 billion, that sounds like a lot of money. That's about a quarter of what Bill Gates has in the bank. 
That's like one one zillionth of the tax cuts they just voted for. And I told you it costs our society $167 billion a year. Now, one more time, I'm you guys are practical New Englanders, right? Let's say you own a house, and let's say there's a hole in your roof, and you're losing, uh, uh, I, I would have said, $167 a year in, in heating costs, because you never had cooling costs, but wait till global warming. So heating or cooling costs, you're losing $167 a year. A handy woman or handy man comes to you and says, I can fix it for 25. And you know they're telling the truth. They've done good work for your neighbors. If you can fix a problem for $25 billion or 25 bucks that cost you $167 billion, wouldn't you fix it? Of course you would. And they say, well, if we have the money in our pocket. If we have $1.5 trillion in our pocket for more tax cuts, we have $25 billion in our pocket so veterans, children, people with disabilities, and working parents can feed their families. Hard. You say, oh, our political system's broken. I get you, Joel, you're right, but since we can't fix the political system, we'll do our food drive. That's defeatist. You know what's hard? Crossing over the Bering Land Strait about you know, 20,000 years ago, uh, Native Americans coming to America for the first time, that was hard. Crossing the Rockies in a wagon train, that was hard. Slaves, Captured, jumping off slave ships, committing suicide rather than going to slavery. That was hard. American soldiers landing at Normandy Beach under withering machine gun fire and mortar fire from the Nazis. That was hard. Susan B. Anthony chaining herself to a polling booth with threat of violence just to fight for the right to vote. That was hard. John Lewis and millions of others doing things like marching over the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, being beaten almost to death, fighting for the right to vote. That's hard. And you know it. A single parent looking their kids in the eye and saying, we can't afford to feed you tonight. That's hard. Taking five minutes Monday morning to call Senator Collins and Senator, your other senator, if you isn't. <laughs> That's easy. What's other senator saying? Okay, guy who's king, right. Taking five minutes to call your senators on Monday, that's easy. Taking an afternoon to go to a protest, that's easy. Taking a day to go to Augusta, or two days to go to Washington, that's easy. And given the sacrifices our forefathers and foremothers made for us, it's the least we can do. And we can finally be the generation that joins the rest of the civilized world and ends domestic hunger. Thank you. until they closed the place down. Then I stood afterwards, some people shot, want to ask me afterwards. I stayed for like an hour, and then someone vlogged the next day. That jerk, he didn't want to hear anyone else's opinion. So I'll start with anyone who disagrees with me. If you're a communist and you're mad that I defended the free, you know, job creation as a way to reduce hunger, I'll start with you. Or if you're a conservative who, who thinks I'm a horrible, dangerous person who shouldn't be allowed in your state borders, I'll start with you. <laughs> or a moderate who thinks I claim to be a moderate, but I sure don't act moderate. Go ahead, sir. You, sir. Uh, how do we get uh, less junk food being um, consumed? The way to get less junk food consumed is make healthier food affordable and available and convenient. You know, we at, I haven't talked about what my organization does, Hunger Free America, but we do a lot of things around the country. We run a national hunger hotline. We have a national volunteerism initiative where you can go to hungervolunteer.org to find out how to be more effective in your volunteerism. Uh, we, we run a national VISTA AmeriCorps program, but we also started as the New York City Coalition Against Hunger, and we have a lot of special programs in New York City, including a community-supported agriculture pro project, a CSA project in New York City, where we take food from upstate farmers, mostly small local farmers, many of whom are sustainable, organic, and we subsidize it very heavily. We put it in neighborhoods where the low-income people live, and we have it hours that are convenient for low-income working people at nights because most low-income people are working and we have waiting lists at every site. So the belief of some, let's say you belief of some, the reason low-income people aren't eating more healthfully is, is that they're ignorant or something culturally wrong or they, they get those some foods. They don't know cotton and doesn't grow when you know the rack at the store. You know, yes they do. Uh, and, and, and so 
you know, but we also have to be realistic about the economics of it, and we have to be realistic about the time concern. I love Michael Pollan. I met him once, super nice guy, but some of him and the Mark Pittmans of the world and the Alice Waters, you know, she, she was once asked this famous celebrity chef, Alice Waters, you know, what should poor people do if they, they can't afford organic produce? And she said, buy one less pair of Nikes which is really classified, but I would argue probably has a, a racial undertone as well. Michael Palm, who I love, <coughs> once said, wealthy people have more money than time, poor people have more time than money, so wealthy people should spend more money on food, and poor people should spend more time preparing food. Well, first of all, poor people already spend a boatload of time preparing food. 80% of the low-income families in America cook dinner at home four nights or more. And for all the stereotypes that people are using their food stamps and fast food, you can't legally use food stamps or SNAP at fast food in the vast majority of states in the Union, including Maine. Low-income people are already cooking. Even though they have one or two or three jobs, they're often traveling by public transportation. Here, there is an underwriting or, or very little, so it's really hard. And you know, for the people from the right to say they need to be religious, though the people are usually in America and everywhere in the world the most religious people. So they're working six days a week, praying the seventh, and by the way, on the side, they're raising their kids and taking care of their grandparents without the help of a home health care attendant or a nanny. You know, and living in a place like Maine where your growing season isn't uh, 52 weeks out of the year. And so this idea that a lot of people tell me, oh, you know, they should just grow all their own food. It's just not a realistic understanding. So I say, and, and the other thing I would say, yes, low-income people don't eat healthily in America, but the difference between low-income people and wealthy people in America today is not nearly as big as the difference between everyone today and everyone 50 years ago. I talk for a living instead of like moving boulders around, so that means that I seem to be using some energy now, but not as much as I was moving boulders. Uh, number one and number two, just the, the nature of all diets in developed societies is, is very different today. And there, there, there are plenty of very wealthy people who, who have plenty of nutrition education and are still healthy. So there are cultural reasons, there are emotional reasons, there are genetic reasons, there are societal reasons. But there's no question that hunger and obesity are flip sides of the same malnutrition coin because the risk factors increase. Uh, first of all, exercise is hard. You know, I'm a professional. I'm theoretically in charge of my organization. If I want to come in 15 minutes later one morning because I went for a little longer at the gym, I can. I can afford a gym membership. Many low income people don't have gyms in the neighborhood can't afford it and certainly don't have the flexibility of the time. So that's one. And two, you know, uh, even if the food's affordable, and in, in general, unhealthy food is, is, is more affordable uh, than, than healthy food, it often doesn't exist in low-income neighborhoods. They're often food deserts, and then often it takes more time to prepare. So I say good nutrition. It's got to have nutrition education, but it's got to make the food available and, and affordable. And I think we need more healthier fast food restaurants. Uh, so my best friends are slow food advocates, but I suggest that's a class bias notion. They are you yeah, to be virtuous, you need five hours to cook dinner. Yes? Should we have a soda tax? I don't think we should have a soda tax, and I definitely don't think we should have uh, restrictions on soda in the SNAP program. And I, and I go into this in, in great detail in my new book, and maybe you probably disagree with me, I'll, I'll just say, first of all, I, 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 the people who are advocating, frankly, sometimes are not too consistent. They admit to me they occasionally drink a soda, but they're responsible enough to drink it in the right portions. Or that my tax dollars aren't paying for it. If it's in SNAP, you know, my tax dollars would be paying for it. I say, well, every soda in America is subsidized by the government. You understand we subsidize sugar, we subsidize roads, we subsidize ports, they're transported for it. So, and I once debated the state health commissioner in New York who wanted to take soda out of the SNAP program, and I said to you, will you ban soda machines? In, in, in your uh, buildings where your workers worked. He said, no, that's entirely different. He said, it's entirely the same. And uh, I speak at many public health colleges where there's whole departments railing against soda, and inevitably they have soda machines in the faculty lounge. So I, I just, what's that? Soda tax is different than so, Soda tax is a little different, except I think there's a problem with demonizing one product. That the, re the only thing that's ever been proven to reduce weight is moderation. People exercise more and eat less. That's the one and only thing. And if you give the false impression it's one product, and, and it used to be fat, but it was saturated fat, and then you had these fat-free products that had you know, a zillion carbs, and then it became carbs, and now the one and only obsession is soda. Now, the smallest portion of Coke is 120 calories, less than many bags of nuts. I'm not saying nuts aren't in general healthier than Coke, but the issue is portion size and control and balance. And in families where kids are totally banned junk food, they actually get heavier after they leave the home, just in many places in conserved areas where people take chastity pledges, and then when they do have you know, intimate relations, they're far less likely to have protected responsibility. 
responsible sex and have kids and, and, and diseases. And so I think the real issue is teaching responsibility, not saying that there's one thing that's uniquely bad. And, and many people I know who you know, want to tax soda would not tax their artisanal little part pork belly, you know, uh, kimchi, pork belly, you know, mashup, which probably has five times as many calories as 120, you know, uh, calories from a can of soda. So I, I'm sure most of you disagree with me, but I also think they, they, they generally don't work. So I'd be less opposed to a soda tax than I would be to unique restrictions on low income people, but honestly a tax is still, uh, you know, a sales tax is a regressive, you know, tax that falls more deeply on low income people. I think if you made orange juice more affordable and milk more affordable and then healthier foods more affordable, then that's a better way to do it. Yes? Uh, how would you suggest we fight the misperception in the public space of people using SNAP programs? That they're misusing it, that they're abusing it, you know, the kind of demonization of quote unquote the welfare mom having more kids to get a bigger check. There was a specific case in Maine a few years ago um, that somebody was using a uh, SNAP program or something to uh, buy uh, cases of water, go out to the parking lot, empty the water, take the bottles back, and then eventually buy their coffee brandy. Right. Um, and so, and then all of a sudden that became a story. And everybody has a story that, you know, they're starting from the assumption that people are misusing this. So how do we fight that? Well, I'd say a few things. Number one, and, 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 and uh, if you guys, this book in my first book, I, 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 I no, the new book, I have a piece of hate mail sent to me and how I responded to it. And I don't know if any of you saw this Fox special on how evil food stamps were a few years ago. It was 50 minutes in prime time about how horrible SNAP was. They featured this surfer dude who, who got SNAP and was really ir irresponsible about it. And I gave them, uh, and I was the only person defending the program. No one from the Obama administration at the time agreed to be in it. No other groups agreed to be in it. It's just me and like 20 conservatives. And I knew they were going to edit it out of context because it wasn't live. I prefer doing live because they can't edit. All they can do is shut you up. They, all they can do is turn off your mic and then they look bad. So I gave them literally like three or four hours of interviews. And over and over again, they asked me the same question. Uh, do you believe SNAP reduces the spirit of independence? No, they asked me over and over again, do you think the top answer to hunger in America is, is food stamps? And I said, no. The top answer to hunger in America is creating jobs, ensuring they pay a living wage, and when that's not enough, everyone who needs it should get SNAP benefits. So of course, they asked me over and over again, and being a disciplined person, having a media background, I answered over and over again the exactly same way, and what did they do? They took my sentence, cut it in half, and took out the part, no, everyone should have a living wage job, and should be paid enough to feed their families, but when that's not enough, they should have food stamps to feed their They just put it, they should have food stamps to feed their families. And they found, you know, the program at the time had like 45 million people in it, and they found one person uh, supposedly misusing it. You know, the fraud rate in the SNAP program is about 1.3%. Uh, now, it's a big program, so 1.3% of 60 or $70 billion, that's a lot of money. But you find me a defense contract with fraud as low as 1.3%. You show me a bank that loses only 1.3%. In, in, in fraud, and I'll tell you, you're the most successful business person, you know, ever. And by the way, the fraud rate in Congress, the percentage of members of Congress forced to resign in, in, in uh, ethical cloud or go to prison is about 2%. So they ought to think about that before deriding, you know, low income, uh, you know, people. Any program with tens of millions of people in it, you're going to find some no goodness. But you compare it to other programs, it's extraordinarily low well, fraud rate. You know, and I wrote a piece comparing SNAP to Social Security, and that. Social Security is defined as something we all earned. It's not welfare. We all earned it. We put in money. We just take out. It's not welfare. And as a result of that ideology, it's really easy to get Social Security payments in the United States. My mother got them for decades until she passed. You know, the check was never laid a day. And the, 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 it's run directly by the federal government. Uh, states can't make it hard for you to get. And the, the processes are same in all 50 states because that's the ideology. The ideology for SNAP is it's welfare. You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You bum. And by law, the federal government doesn't run the programs, the states run the programs, and that's because southern segregationists who designed the programs purposely wanted states to be able to keep it away from certain kinds of people. That's the fact. And yet, these are myths. Social Security, many people, particularly people who live longer, who are more likely to be white because white people live longer and wealthier people live longer, they take out more than they put in. That's why we're having a national debate over the solvency. If everyone was just taking out what they put in, there'd be no national debate. So that's sort of like welfare, isn't it? Now SNAP, the vast majority of people in the SNAP program are working. 
even if they're temporarily unemployed, they're paying sales taxes, they're paying property taxes, and most are working most of their lives. So in fact, SNAP, so food stamps are far more like Social Security than anyone wants to admit. And Social Security is far more like welfare than anyone wants to admit. And the truth is, the only horrible government program is a horrible program that someone else gets other than me. And that's, you know, that's the reality. Out of the top 10 states in the union that depends on SNAP benefits, top 10 states in the union ranked by percentage of the population getting SNAP benefits, eight voted for Donald Trump. And so it's this myth, again, racially based, he always uses the term inner cities, but it's these other places. So I, I think what I tell the book is this person, after I was on Fox, wrote me this, I'm like, why, you know, you're a horrible communist, go all the country, you know, why are you talking about this? So my response to this person, I have it in, in the book, is look, my father was a decorated, you know, World War II veteran, and he, you know, risked his life for this country so that you and I could disagree. I hope you can respect my ability to discreet, but I also hope you understand many people on SNAP are active duty military personnel as well as veterans. So rather than you lying jerk, I start, let, let me try to connect with him on his values. I, I, uh, I notice, sir, you live near a national park. I assume you enjoy that national park. Sometimes we benefit for things for, for the greater you know, public good. You know, fraud is this low in the program, this, this night provide sites. Even someone from the Bush administration said this. I don't know whether he's changed his mind, but we had a conversation. One, two other quick stories about the Fox interview. So uh, Brett Baer was interviewing me, and he said, uh, don't you think food stamps dilute the spirit of independence that made America great. And I always over-prepare for these. I said, well, Brett, you went to DePaul University, right? He goes, you know, why? I said, well, Brett, 60% of DePaul students get federal student aid. And your boss at the time, Roger Gales, I didn't know at the time he was a serial sexual harasser, but I'm not shocked. Uh, your boss, Roger Gales, he went to Ohio University, a state university, arguably a socialist institution. I think it makes my country stronger that my tax dollars helped your boss and many of your peers pay for college, just as it makes my country stronger that my tax dollars help ensure my neighbors don't starve so they can buy food that contributes to American farmers. They didn't use that. So those are some of the things you, you, you can do. Some people can be convinced and some people can't be convinced, just like the supporters of George Wallace. If there are people back then who thought Martin Luther King was an inferior human being because of his skin color, you can't convince them. Some of those people are still alive today. Some of those kids are still alive today. Some of them you can't convince them. You can try, but uh, some of them just have to be defeated through democratic means because there are more people who feel a different way. And people have to come out and vote because victory belongs to people who show up. Well, thank you so much. Bye, I'll sign them. Or you can send me hate mail at Michael Moore at michaelmoore.com. <laughs>